You have pointed out that it says when we enter Av, we lessen our Semcha. And I had a friend of mine who had a wonderful mind at being able to see, you know, those, those cute little contradictions in life, you know. And he said, the happiest day of the year is approaching. He says, the happiest day of the year is Erev Rosh Chodesh Av. How does your figure? It says, when you enter Adar, Mabim Basimcha, you increase your Simcha. And nowhere does it say to stop. So you get happier and happier through Adar, through Nisan, through Iyar, through Sivan, through Tammuz. And then when you hit Av, it says Ma'atim Basimcha, which means that you're going into Av at the peak of your happiness, and then you get more and more depressed till Adar. Now, <laughs> that's obviously not correct, but it is one of those cute kind of observations. And, uh, and the fact of the matter is that Simcha is a very, uh, a very difficult thing under the best of circumstances. Uh, when I was teaching in Or Sameach, there was a fellow there who lived in the Shtachim. And I remember he came to me after class and he says, I don't know what to do. He says, someone in our Yishuv was killed in a terrorist attack. They're going to have the funeral today. And then there's a young man in Or Sameach who's getting married tonight. He says, how do I go from one to the other? And the truth of the matter is that that is the constant challenge of a Jew. Constant challenge of a Jew. To be able to go from tragedy to simcha and back and forth. Um, Rabbonim do this on a regular basis. They go to a bris, then they go to a funeral, then they go to a levaya, then, uh, uh, sorry, a levaya, then they go visit someone in the hospital, then they go to a wedding. You know, there's, our, our lives are complex. The world is complex. And uh, even, even in tragedy, uh, friends of mine had to go to a Leviah once. And they were saying, Tefillah Sederach. Right, the, the Tefillah you say on your way to a, uh, when you have to travel. And it says, we should bring us to our destination, Besimcha. So he says, I'm going to a funeral. How am I going to go Besimcha? And he himself said to me, he says, because you can have a multitude of emotions at the same time. I could be sad that I'm going to a funeral, and I could be happy that I got there alive. So, uh, so life is complex. Having said that, right, the three weeks that began on Shabbos, it's kind of interesting, you know, um, I spoke at a Shavasa Batamas event on Sunday. I said, that's a little tricky because today is the 18th of Tammuz, not the 17th. The 17th was Shabbos, yeah? It was a, I remember when I was a kid, they had a, had a riddle. Is there a 4th of July in England? Yes, and a 5th of July, and a 6th of July. The question is, the 4th of July means the Independence Day. Is there an Independence Day? The answer is no, there is no Independence Day in England. Uh, I had an English student who said to me, there's only two dates that every English student has to remember, 1066 and 1966. 1066 was when William the Conqueror captured England from the Anglo-Saxons and began modern England. 1966 was the last time England won the World Cup. <laughs> now, since we're Americans, I have to explain that the whole world plays soccer, except for us. Everybody plays soccer. It's a major sport, and they take it very seriously. If your team is in a game in the World Cup, you can't reach anybody in the country. Everybody is watching that game. And there was a story in, in Colombia. A guy had kicked the ball into the wrong goal, and when he got off the plane, they shot him. You know what I'm saying? They take this very seriously. And we, most Americans really could care less because we only care about Americans. You know? They say, what, what's someone who's trilingual? Someone who speaks three languages. Bilingual, two languages. Monolingual, American. You know what I'm saying? We don't really care. So we take one American baseball team and play another American baseball team and call it the World Series. You know what I'm saying? That's it. You know? So, uh, so even though Shavasa Batamuz was Sunday, what we mean is there's a concept called Shavasa Batamuz, just like there's a concept called Tishbav. I remember during the first Gulf War, I had been living in Israel for about three years, and we were under imminent missile attack. I don't know how many of you have been under missile attack. It's really very nerve-wracking, you know? You go out with your family and you pick up, you know, um, gas masks, you know? adult gas masks, children gas masks, and little gas cribs, which are these little rectangular plastic bags that you stick the baby in and roll it up, you know, and, you know, and they give you out nerve gas shots and stuff. It's really very nerve-wracking, and people were very nervous, and they asked Rosh Hashanah Zalman Orbach, the great saint of Jerusalem, 
If you want insight into him, my friend Chanach Teller wrote a beautiful biography called From Jerusalem, His Word. He was close to Rosh Hashanah. And they asked Rosh Hashanah, what's going to be? And he says, I'm not a Navi or the son of a Navi, but I promise you the following. The coalition gave Iraq the deadline of January 15th to pull out of Iraq. I'm telling you that on January 16th, the Jewish people are going to say Hallel. And this year, we're going to eat meat on Tisha B'Av. And the word spread through the streets of Yerushalayim. Shlomo Zalman said the day after the deadline, we're going to say Hallel, and we're going to eat meat on Tisha B'Av. And then somebody realized that January 16th was Rosh Chodesh. We always say Hallel. And that year, Tisha B'Av came out on Shabbos. But for a while there, we were really very excited, you know? Because Rosh Hashanah was having to have a little fun at our expense. But anyway, but, uh, you know, but, but Tisha B'Av and Shavos Matamas are concepts beyond merely the date. The date gives us an idea. But these three weeks are a time of, uh, of you know, tragedy for the Jewish people. It always has been, yeah? And we tend to repeat events. Uh, let me explain what I mean by that, you know. Time brings with it certain opportunities, just like place does, you know. You go to the beach, you have certain opportunities. You go to a gold mine, you have certain opportunities. You go, you know, to a holy place. Mishnah and Caleb says there are ten levels of Kedusha, you know. The first being the land of Israel. The second one being cities that were walled from the time of Yehoshua the third being Yerushalayim, the fourth being the base of Mikdash, and it continues on until the 10th level, which is Uman. Um, but uh, <laughs> now I'm just basing that on the fact that I know there are people who leave Yerushalayim and go to Uman, so it must be, it, it is the 10th level. But anyway, but um, uh, actually, uh, the mission doesn't say, it, it says the Kosha Kedoshim, the Holy of Holies, but okay, whatever. Yeah, the, each place, places have opportunities in them, just as time does. Let me ask you a question. Can you do tshuva anytime you want? If a person wanted to do tshuva right now, could a person repent? Sure you could. So what's so special about Yom Kippur? Okay, so if you take a child-proof cap, then only children can open, right? Because at my age, I can't open them. <laughs> you give them to a little kid. Could you open this for me? Sure, Grandpa, boom, pops it right open, yeah? But so you know, if you line up the two arrows, at least theoretically, you could open it very easily. Let's say the arrows aren't lined up. Could you open it? Yeah, get a pair of pliers and rip it off, take a knife and cut it open. You could still open it, but it's much harder. At certain times, there are greater opportunities. So this is what happened in history 3,300 years ago, give or take. Yeah? Moshe goes up the mountain on Shavuos, 40 days and 40 nights. Comes down with the Luchos, first set of tablets, and finds that we had built the golden calf. He breaks the Luchos. He says, you guys are in really serious trouble. I'm going to try to get God to forgive you. Goes up for another 40 days and 40 nights, comes down and says, okay, God's not going to draw, destroy you, but this Shachanti B'Socham, there's a dwelling in your midst, that's not going to happen anymore. And Moshe took his tent and set it up outside of the camp and called it the Ohel Moed, and the cloud went over it and said, me and God will live out here. You guys stay in the camp, have a good time, and, you know, do whatever you want to do. And the people said, no, we want that opportunity again. We want to get back what we lost. No, we, we have the concept that we can almost always make up for something that we did, but it's not really true. Sometimes it can't, right? Shaul Melech, King Saul, lost the kingship, never got it back. You know, Tisha B'Av, the decree was made, and even though the next day the people got up and said, we're really sorry, and they, they you know, put on their weapons, and they got ready, God said, it's too late, too late, you blew it. But in this instance, God said yes. And Moshe goes up for another 40 days and 40 nights and bring down the second tablets, the second luchos on Yom Kippur, and that is the Torah that we have today. The Torah we were supposed to have, we never got. That Torah was destroyed. When he broke those first luchos, the second luchos were not the same luchos. Yeah? I'll give you a simple example. The Medrash says there were supposed to be holidays in Tammuz of an Elul, and they were removed because of the sin of the golden calf, and all of them were moved into Tishrei. So in the Torah, there would have been holidays in Tammuz of an Elo. Those are gone. Those are gone. Those, those, those aren't going to happen. So the Torah that we have today is different. Al-Tikra, charis ahaluchos, ela charis ahaluchos. Don't read carved, read freedom. And this is what the, the Chazal say. 
Freedom from death, freedom from forgetting, freedom from the Yetzirah, freedom from, that would have been it. That would have been the Messianic era. We would have moved out of this world back into Gan Eden, back to the way it was before Adam and Chava did their first sin. It would have been a world back in completion. We lost that. And that was Yom Kippur. And then what happens? We say we're going to build a Mishkan. We spend days collecting, and they start building it on Sukkot. That is why, says the Vilna Gaon, we celebrate the Anani Kavo, the clouds of glory, because they returned when we started to build it. We put it up on Rosh Chodesh Nisan, and the princes all brought their offerings, and the Nesim brought their offerings, and then we had Pesach, and then the people who were Tomei said, I want another Pesach. We had Pesach Sheni on the 14th of the year, and then on the 20th, the Torah says, we began a dramatic march to Eretz Israel. Three days, and the people said, are we there yet? I'm tired. And they complained. And then after they complained about the trip, they said, you know, I haven't had a steak like him forever. And then we had the whole story of the meat, and that went on for a month. And then we had the story with Miriam, and she was locked up outside of the Machina for a week, and the people didn't travel. And now, at the end of uh, Sivan, we're ready to go. And the people say, let's send out scouts and check out the land. And they went out, they returned on the 8th of Av, gave their evil report. That night, the Jewish people cried, and God gave the decree that we would all die in the desert. And that was the end. So the events that we commemorate on the 17th of Tammuz and the 9th of Av were actually separated by more than a year. But they are the same event. That's what Rashi says in at least four places. God said you're going to be in the desert for 40 years. He predated it a year. Why? Because when we built the golden calf, says Rashi, he already thought to make this decree. It was already Ola Badaitai, and this, he was just waiting till it was finished. The Moraglim and the Cheta Ego was a one-two punch. Yeah, he says in a number of other places, both places you find that he uses the Yud Gimel Midos, the divine attributes. You know, in both places, uh, he brings the argument, what is Egypt going to say? There's a lot of similarities in the two stories. However it is, we see that historically these two events are related. So that in the second Beis HaMikdash, the second temple, they break through the walls on the 17th of Tammuz, and they set fire to it on the 9th of Av. Those three weeks were a period of time of tragedy and destruction. Now, because we're here and we're not in Israel and the temple has not been rebuilt, I would say it's safe to assume that when the 17th of Tammuz came around, once again, on some level, we built the golden calf and Moshe broke the luchas. And we now have less than three weeks to see whether or not we're going to cry for no reason and give up hope yeah, and, and, and God's salvation, and if we're going to make the same mistake of Tishvav. We have for the past 3,300 years. That's why we are where we are. Yeah? I think it was Winston Churchill who said, man will occasionally stumble upon the truth, but he usually picks himself up and keeps going. Yeah? We, we know that there are problems. We know that there's something that we have to do, but very often I tell something to somebody, and they say, yeah, easier said than done. I said, everything's easier said than done, except for Krishna. That's the only thing that's just as easy to do as it is to say. But otherwise, you're right. Of course it's easy to say. But if we could at least understand what the problem is, if we could put our finger on the point, and we could actually figure out what it is we're supposed to change, then maybe we stand a better chance. So there's a question everybody asks that I don't really understand, and that is, how could the Dora Mudba, the Dora Deya, this generation that saw the exodus of Egypt and heard God speak, how could the generation like that build the golden calf? I don't understand the question, and I'll show you why. If you look at the text, I understand the question. If you look at Rashi, I don't understand the question at all. In fact, I don't understand Shevet Levi. I don't understand the people who were not participating in the building of the golden calf. Yeah? So let's read the story the first way so that it, you know, makes our heroes look bad. The people saw that Moshe delayed coming down from the mountain. And they assemble to Aaron, but God, uh, Moshe had left Aaron and Chor in charge. Where was Chor? They killed him. Yeah? And they say to Aaron, 
build us a God to go before us. Because the man Moshe took us out of Egypt. I don't know what happened to him. Aaron says, Take your wife and your daughter's jewelry and bring it to us. Rashi says their wives would not give them the jewelry, so they brought their own jewelry. The Das Kanem says their wives wouldn't give them their jewelry, so they ripped it off of them. Okay. Yeah, doesn't look good for our heroes, right? And Aaron made a molten calf. This is your God, O Israel, who took you out of Egypt. Aaron and Aaron saw it. Doesn't say what he saw. And Aaron built the altar, and he says, "Tomorrow will be a holiday to God." All right. So you're right. Sounds pretty bad. You take a look at Rashi. He paints a completely different story. Yeah. Kiboshesh Moshe. Moshe gave them a sign. Um, when I go up the mountain, I will come back on the 40th day by the sixth hour, by noon. They thought the first day that he went up counted. And so they thought that not the 17th, but the 16th was the 40th day. And on the 16th, the Satan came, the Arvev es Ha'olam. Arvev es Ha'olam. Stirred, mixed, confused. How exactly are we translating that word? Um, and showed them the appearance of darkness, deep darkness, and arvuvia. Um, mixture, confusion, again. Loimra, they said, Vadai meis Moshe, arvuvia They said, Moshe must have died, and that's the reason that this arvuvia is coming to the world. One more Rashi. Kizem Moshe Haish, because this man Moshe, Kimin Demus Moshe, Hara Lahem Hasotan, Shenosim Ba'avia Harakia Shemaim. The Satan showed them Moshe dead being carried up to heaven. Okay, let's put this in the context. Moshe says to the Jewish people, here's the plan. God's going to speak to me the Ten Commandments, and I'm going to tell it to you. And the people said, no, no. We want to hear God speak ourselves. And he says, I don't think that's a good idea, because if you're not on the level for that type of prophecy, it can be a wrenching experience. you have any idea how difficult that is? Avraham was not spiritually developed enough. When he had a prophecy, he was shaking on the ground. It was so difficult for him. Yeah, and that wasn't even, so to speak, hearing God speak. That was just a, he got an image and he had to understand it. You're thinking about hearing God talk like, like he talks to me, pun him upon him, face to face. If you're not on the level, you're not going to be able to sustain this. And they said, we don't care, we want to hear it anyway. He says, okay, prepare for three days. They gather on the mountain, and Moshe's standing up there, and Hashem begins to speak, whatever that means. Obviously, he doesn't have a voice. It was some sort of an unbelievable prophetic thing where the Torah tells us they saw the sounds and heard the sights. It was something out of our, our conception. And God spoke, which means that he revealed himself to them. And he said, I am the Lord your God that took you out of the land of Egypt. Bam! They all died. But everybody, except for Moshe, Aaron, uh, Shevet Levi, everybody was dead. Moshe's looking around at the entire Jewish people wiped out, kind of, you know, making a man a little nervous, you know. And God brings them all back to life. Now, I don't know what that's like to die and come back to life. You know, uh, Voldemort tried to describe it, but I, I don't know if he really did justice to the experience of having his soul ripped out of you. But I don't know. But uh, they all died, came back to life. Devastating experience. Everybody okay? Yeah, I think so. Okay, you ready? Yeah, all right. Lo do not have any guys before me. Bam! They all die again. But everybody dead. Moshe says, wow, this is starting to look bad. God says, don't worry, I do this all the time, yeah? <laughs> Brings everybody back to life, 
Yeah, a little woozy. Which says, your guy is okay? Yeah, yeah, only eight more to go. And someone in the crowd says, you know, I'm thinking. How about instead God speak to Moshe and Moshe speaks to us? Yeah, great idea. And Moshe says, don't you want to hear God? Nope. We are convinced. Very impressive. <laughs> yeah, but uh, you only die twice, I think. Uh, in fact, I don't even know if that it was a, uh, what do you call it, movie? Yeah, um, James Bond, you only live twice. Yeah? But uh, I died twice. I think that's really quite enough. You know what I mean? So, uh, so we trust you, Moshe, yeah? So Moshe speaks the last eight of the Dibros. And then he said, you guys going to be OK? Yeah. OK, I'm going up now to get the Luchos. Hurry back, because they're a little nerve wracking. Right? We're sitting around this mountain with fire and flames and God, and, and it's like, whoa, you know, I just dropped dead twice, you know? So, uh, so Moshe walks into the midst of the flame and the smoke, and the Jewish people are somewhat nervous. Because they're thinking to themselves, could you imagine if we had to face God ourselves every time we need a halacha? You know, is this bow rare? Bam, you're dead. You know what I mean? So wait and see if God brings you back to life. You know what I mean? I know people who pass out during halacha shiurim, but this is a whole <laughs> different experience, you know what I mean, than what we're used to, you know? So he says, uh, okay, Moshe goes up. And they're waiting, and they're waiting, and they're waiting. And comes what they think is the 40th day, just about at noontime, and the entire world begins to collapse. Now, they know what this means, because Rashi says clearly that Moshe wrote down the entire Torah from Bereshus till Matan Torah and gave it to them. So they came to the Pasuk in Perak Aleph, Vayi Erev, Vayi Voker, Yom HaShishi. The 16th of, excuse me, the 6th of Sivan. If you accept the Torah, good, and if not, I will return the world to Tovavohu, to emptiness and nothingness. Emptiness, void, whatever you want to translate it, and darkness. And if we don't accept the Torah, the world is going to unravel. There was mixture, confusion, chaos. Boker is Seder. As Rashi says, light and darkness were mixed together. Every time I see that Rashi, what does that mean? Can I even imagine? That was a checkerboard. It was like waves. You know, I can't even imagine how darkness and light exist at the same time without boundaries. You know, so whatever it was, everything was mixed together, and God gave it the rules of nature. He organized everything. Vayi erev, vayi voke. It went from a state of disorder to order. Right, and now they're seeing arvuvia, vayi erev. They see Choshech and Tahon, uh, and, and uh, Aphela. They see the universe unraveling. They see the time-space continuum coming apart at the edges. I don't know what it looks like when the universe itself disintegrates, but it cannot be good. Yeah? And the people are seeing this, and they're saying, uh-oh, we're in trouble. So they run to Aaron and Chor and say, do you guys see what's going on here? You know, the entire universe is collapsing. And the chorus says, please return to your tents. There's nothing to see. Please disperse. Now, Chor, we're trying to save the universe, and Chor is blocking us. Right? We've seen this a dozen times. You know, it's our job trying to stop James Bond from uh, defusing the baton. Whatever it is, there's, there's always the bad guy you've got to fight before you get to the bomb, you know, and save the universe, pull the switch, whatever the case happens to be, you know. So they kill Hur because he's in the way, and they say to Aaron, Aaron, you're a nice guy, but take a look up there. There's your brother Moshe, and he's dead. Now, you're nice, but you ain't your brother Moshe because when we all drop dead, you drop dead too. So if Moshe couldn't do it, Ha'ish Moshe, then no human being can do this. We need something to use to communicate with God, something else, like a mishkan. And this golden calf was nothing to, to take lightly. The Chazal say they pulled it down from the Kisei covered, whatever that means. This was a very powerful thing. How powerful was this thing just to put into a context for you? Yeah? The Vilna Gaon has a parish on Chad Gad Yoh. And he says the following, uh, The stick came and beat the dog. Medrash Rabbah says that the dog was Paro. And the, mata was the, the stick was the Mata of Moshe. 
and came the fire and burns the stick. What's the fire? Churban Bayis Rishon. The fire that burnt the Beis Mikdash ended the effect of the Mata because the Mata took us out of Egypt. Let us build the Mishkan. The Mishkan turned into the Beis Mikdash, and when that was destroyed, then the whole Mahalach of the Mata was over. To the point that the Gemara Megillah says that the Jews asked, do we still have to keep the Torah? If a man divorces his wife, does she still have the right to demand that he listens to her? God ended that. It's all over. Our house is gone. Everything's over. So comes the Torah, the water, the Anshagnesa Gedola, and brings it back. But, but the whole Mahalach of the Mata ended at that point. A strange thing. Very strange. Yeruvim ben Nevat takes apart Klai Yisrael, brings the ten northern tribes, makes the northern kingdom. They make him king. And Rechavim, the son of Shlomo Melech, he remains king of Yehuda and Binyam. And Yeruvim gets nervous that when the base of Mikdash, you know, you have to go there in Sukkot. So the people will go to the base of Mikdash and they'll become reattached to the southern kingdom and he'll lose uh, his control. So instead of the base of Mikdash, he builds not one but two golden calves. If there is one thing that should be in the collective subconscious of the Jewish people that you do not build, it is a golden calf. And he built two of them. Why? For exactly this reason. He said, you know why the people were wrong when they built the golden calf? Because they thought Moshe was dead and he wasn't. But if he was, if that had been disqualified, then the next fallback plan is the golden calf. And now that Beis David and the Beis and Mikdash have been disqualified, the next fallback plan is a golden calf. And that's why, even when they got rid of all of the Avodah Zorah, they never got rid of those two golden calves. The Sefer Malachim says over and over again, because Yerub ben Nevat was the greatest Torah scholar, and he gave this argument, and it was so convincing that everyone... So this golden calf wasn't a simple thing. They brought it down, they threw it, it was an unbelievable thing that they had accomplished, right? So, uh, so they said, okay, listen, Aaron, you're either with us or against us. So he says, okay, you know, Hur's dead. I could say no, they'll kill me and they'll do it anyway. Stole for time? I'll stole for time. So he says, okay, go and ask your wives and daughters for their jewelry. And they come home and they say, honey, I need all your jewelry. He says, why? He says, because we're going to build a golden calf. He says, no, I don't think so. He says, yeah, yeah, because Moshe's dead. No, he's not. We saw him dead go up to Shemayim. No, you didn't. Yes, I did. I, and, and, and the whole world is falling apart. No, it's not. Yes, it is. Look out the window. You know, the entire world is collapsing. No, it isn't. You know, Husbands understand this. Uh, wives sometimes can be so completely unreasonable, you know, even though to us it's obvious. We, we know. We know the truth. We don't have to ask any questions. We just know, you know. If you don't believe me, um, I'm going to have to go back many, many years, you know, into ancient history. Before there was Waze, there was a GPS. Before there was a GPS, there was what was called a pencil and paper, and you used to write down directions. Uh, most men did not do that. Most men would say, I'll know it when I see it. And they would be driving in the Catskill Mountains. They would come to a T-junction, 44, 45, 54, 55, one of those roads. It's trees as far as you can see in both directions. And they're looking and they go, it's to the left. The wife says, why don't you ask somebody? I know. <laughs> and they drive with absolute confidence, three miles, four miles, five miles. And then the resolve becomes a little shaky and they say, I think it was the other way. And they drive back five miles, and then they start driving. Oh, I, now I'm right. Three miles, four miles, five miles. No, no, I was right the first time. And they drive back. There are still people from last summer still going back and forth. <laughs> Every time another few miles, you know. And the wife is unimpressed by the man's obvious command of the situation. And they'll say, why don't you ask somebody? Because women are OK with that, men are not. Men already know. But Moshe Shapiro says, you know, men want to impact on the world, so what will they do? They'll read the paper, and then they'll yell at their wife. I don't understand what Obama thinks he's doing. Doesn't he see what's going on? This deal is crazy. Isn't it then? Now, they saved the whole world. They yelled at their wife. They explained the geopolitical situation. <laughs> now it's all done. You know what I mean? But uh, women, uh, women are okay not really understanding all the details, how it's going to work out. It's okay. Kosh Baruch Hu promised. That's because the word aim, mother, is related to the word amuna. Because as Rav Hutner explains, a little baby's in a crib. He can only see from here to there. That's it. So that a baby who's nursing can see his mother's face. That's as far as a baby can see. Yeah? And you're lying on your back. 
and all you can do is flail about with your arms and legs. And you're hungry, and you're cold, and you're, and you're dirty, and you're lonely, and you start to cry, and out of nowhere, these hands come and pick you up. And you're like, cool. <laughs> I'm going to cry more often. <laughs> Let's see how far we can push this thing, you know? So, uh, because that's how we learn Amuna. We learn Amuna from our mothers, you know? So they were not taken in. And they said, we are not giving you the jewelry. And according to the Daskanum, they said, I'm taking it anyway. Uh, uh, oh, I hope those were clip-ons. Uh. And they come up with all the jewelry. And they said, oh, your wives gave you the jewelry? No, we ripped it off. Oh, that makes sense. All right, we'll throw it all in. And then we'll set up a committee to decide what to build. Aaron was no idiot. This could take weeks. You know, put out coffee and cake. You don't have to, you know, elect officers. You know, also take suggestions, you know. So I forgot who said the quote, but a camel is a horse designed by a committee. You know what I mean? Like, you know, then we'll talk about it, we'll discuss it. But of course, Micha was there. Micha, who Moshe had pulled out of the wall as a baby because he told God, I know better. And Micha has the little golden thing that says, Alei Shor, that Moshe used to bring up Yosef's uh, a coffin, and he throws it in, and out comes the Egel. And that is what Rashi says on the Pasuk. Viyar Aaron, and Aaron saw. What did he see? Shehoyobo Ruach It was alive. Shene'amar. Ketavni Shor Ochel Esav. Out jumps this golden calf. Walking and talking and eating grass. And the entire world returns to normal. Zoop! Now, come on. If you were there, and you pushed for the building of this, and you saw you just saved the universe, you wouldn't give yourself a shkoyach? Shkoyach! We saved the universe. That's great. I, I, I would like to, you know, what can I say? It's, to my mind, if I was there... I would have for sure been on the side of the Egel. Luckily, I'm a Kohen, so I know I was on the right side. But uh, it's easy for me to talk. But gosh, when you read these arguments, you see Moshe dead. You see the universe collapsing. How did Shevet Levi stand up to this? How did Yoshua miss the Egel? The only member of Klai Israel who missed it. Moshe is praying and fighting with the Kurdish Baruch who saved the Jewish people. Hur is lying dead. Aaron's stalling for time. Shevet Levi is screaming, stop. The air of Rav is making their magic. You know, the, the, the eagle's walking around. All of Klai Israel is confused. And Yehoshua is just standing there waiting for Moshe. He has no idea that anything's going on. Oh, look, there's Moshe dead going up to heaven. Hmm? Anyway, you know. Oh, look at that. All the stars are exploding. Mountains are collapsing. Seas are boiling. Anyway, just waiting for Moshe. <laughs> he's totally... So that by the time that Moshe comes down, he says, hey, sounds like there's trouble in the camp, Batman. You know? He says, I don't know. Doesn't sound like a war to me. Let's go check it out. You know? He had no idea what was going on. He was the only one to miss the whole Egel. How do you see all these events taking place and it doesn't affect you? And let me ask you a different question. I don't think this is fair. You know, the, the sultan has to play fair, doesn't he? You know, this is, this is a ridiculous test. You see Moshe dead. You see the universe collapsing. You know, what did you expect at that point? Well, let's try to understand that part. Let's go back to Gan Eden. A cast of three. Adam, Chava, and the Nachash. And God says to Adam, why did you eat from the tree? And Adam gave the answer that men have been giving for 5,000 years. It's my wife's fault. <laughs> and he says to Chava, why did you eat from the tree? And he says, what can I do? The devil made me do it. Yeah? The, uh, the Nachash tricked me, and I, and I fell for it. You know, It's not my fault. He wasn't fair. He tricked me. So God says, OK, I'm going to start giving out punishments. And the Nachash says, excuse me, I didn't have my day in court. He says, we're going to start with you, Nachash. He says, I'd really like to say something in my own defense. He says, okay, I'm going to cut off your legs. You're going to eat dirt. We're going to smash your head in. He goes, okay, I'm really going to say something now. You know why I did it? You told me to. You told me, go into the garden and tempt mankind, and I did it in record time. I should get a promotion and a raise, and instead you smash my head and make me eat dirt. You know how hard it is to eat dirt with your head smashed in. I don't understand. It's like they say in the unions, don't work too hard or you'll lose your job. You know what I mean? Here, I did a great job, and I'm getting punished. 
So God said, you did a great job. You did too God a job. So when you and humanity are on the same level, it's fine. But now humanity has fallen. If you stay up here, it's no contest. Take a fourth grade girl, a tough fourth grade girl, the toughest girl in fourth grade, and put her up against a heavyweight champion. It's not really a contest. It'll just like punch you through the wall, you know? In universities, they make, uh, make short films. There are awards given out for these short films. I don't know all the awards. One caught my eye. It was called Godzilla Meets Bambi. It was a very short film, yeah? <laughs> Essentially, Bambi comes out, looks at the little butterfly, looks up and goes, and a big foot comes down and squashes Bambi, and that's the end of the film, yeah? It's not much of a contest, you know? That's what it would be like if we're over here and the Sultan is over here. You don't stand a chance. That's why you have a Gemara starring people with like Rebbe Akiva and Rebbe Meir, where the Sultan comes to get them to sin and turns into a beautiful woman. And this one's swimming a, a river and this one's climbing a tree. And he turns back into the Sultan and he says, just remember, Akiva, I could get you anytime I want, but God doesn't let me. You're going to fight the Yetzirah. We're going to fight the Yetzirah. The Yetzirah will destroy you. I will crush you like an eggshell, little man. Crush. You're going to fight the Yetzirah. So, Elawat, God says, listen, what can I tell you? I, I can't make you as powerful. I'm going to cut off your legs, and I'm going to uh, tie your arms behind your back, and you're only going to be able to come from behind. And, because if I ever released you to your full power, you, nobody, Rabbi Akiva wouldn't stand a chance against you. But what happened at Har Sinai? Al tikra choros al haluchos al acheros al haluchos. They reached the level of Adam before the original sin. They were now Adam and Gan Eden. What was Adam and Gan Eden? So it says he ate from the Eight Sadas. Uh, it's always interesting. The Eight Sadas, he ate from the tree of knowledge, and now he had knowledge. The Gemara and Chayiga says that when Adam was created, he saw from one side of the world to the other. He was created with all knowledge. He could look at an animal and tell you everything about it and based upon that, give it a name. He had total understanding of the universe. He knew everything. It, it was a slow deterioration for us to get to where we are today. The, the Gemara says that even before the flood, a baby would be born, just like a little baby horse comes out, stands up and starts walking and neighing right away, neighing right away. That's how a human being was. A little kid would come out, walk across the room, and get the, the knife to cut the cord. You know, you say you have to cut the cord sometime. The kid did it himself. You know, there was no problem. Bye, Mom. You know, you need anything as long as I'm up, you know? And that was it. When, in Gan Eden, it was a world of perfection. The, 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 the bread grew on the trees. You didn't have to do anything to it. It was perfect. You know, they, they, uh, they had everything. You understand, the Nachash had to work pretty hard. And the, what was there was the eight Hadas Tov vera. Not the difference between good and evil. Anybody can tell you the difference between good and evil. Eitz hadas tov and eitz hadas ra. What does the word das mean? No, any of my uh, former students want to jump right in? So I'll tell you how I define it. I have my own definitions. Yeah. I always tell, I used to tell the girls when I used to teach, I'd say, the goal of life is to become independent thinkers. But on the test, write down what I say. <laughs> then you can have your own thoughts. Yeah. Rashi says, Chachma is acquired information. You memorize the encyclopedia. You, you memorize the Library of Congress. You know, uh, you know, whatever it is. You have all the information. Bina is how you understand that knowledge. Because you could have knowledge and come up with different conclusions. Right? Guy cut a, took a, pulled a, a leg off of a spider and said, crawl. And he crawled, pulled off a second leg, third, fourth, fifth. He was down to one leg. And he tells the spider, crawl, he crawls. And he pulls off the last leg, he says, crawl. It didn't crawl. And so he concluded that when you pull all the legs off of a spider, they go deaf. You know, so that's, that's Bina, you know, you can, you can have the facts and come up with the wrong conclusions. You know, I don't know what side you're on, but if you watch either one of the conventions, <laughs> Uh, everybody's coming up with wrong conclusions. <laughs> I don't know who's right, I don't know who's wrong, but they can't, not everybody can be right, not everybody can be wrong, and not about everything. So, you know, there's, there's different conclusions that a person can make when you have information. But once you come up with conclusions, those conclusions is called das. 
When I say aniodeia, and I say I know, I am defining my sense of reality. That's what das is. When I say I know, I'm defining how I perceive reality. Now, people throw around the term I know, and they don't really know. And the best case of where a person doesn't know is when they say it twice. I know, I know. Then they for sure don't know, yeah? When, when a person says I know for real, that it becomes a part of me, it's a total chibor, then if it turns out that that das is not true, it's like cutting off a part of your body, right? So people who know things, they don't really integrate it to that point, right? I'll give you an example. When I went to school, they didn't really have Pluto, the planet, not the dog, yeah? And so the way we remember the planets was, Mary visits every Monday, and, ju and this is the asteroid boy, and just stays until noon. Then they found Pluto. So okay, they had to work fast. Mary visits every Monday and just stays until noon, period. But okay, that was a little lame, so they came up with a new one. My very educated mother just served us nine pies. Right? Very nice. Uh, now it turns out Pluto's not a planet. I haven't found anybody who's upset about this. I said, you know, Pluto's not a planet, but for me it's not a big deal. I just take off the period. But you know how silly everybody else feels? My very educated mother just served us nine... That's it. That's it, they're left hanging. So I tell people Pluto was a planet, it's not a planet, nobody really cares. If you would have told me the whole thing was just a smudge on the lens, I'd also be okay, you know? Nobody cares if there is a Pluto, it's not a Pluto, it's a planet, it's not a planet, you know? But if you found out you were adopted, you know, that would be very upsetting to you. I used to say this, you know? I said, what if you were adopted? He says, no, I'm definitely not. How do you know? My parents told me. Ah, they didn't want you to feel bad. No, but my aunt told me. She's in on it. No, but they have, I look just like my parents. What do you think? They're going to adopt someone who doesn't look like you? You know? Yeah, but I've got baby pictures. Well, they took you from your birth mother. Of course you have baby pictures, you know what I mean? Anyway, at this point, they get a little uncomfortable. They don't want to talk about it anymore, you know? But things are like that. And if you really think about it, you know, um, maybe you're just a brain in a Petri dish, and you're receiving electrical impulses, and you're imagining your existence. I would say to one of my seminary girls, you know, what's your name? And they said, name, where do you come from? I said, it's not true. You're a 45-year-old non-Jewish man in Kansas in an insane asylum. You're hallucinating that you're a Jewish teenager. <laughs> but I'm hoping with therapy and drugs, we can get back to your state, Mr. Smith. You know? <laughs> now, that's very uncomfortable, because let's say it turns out to be true. <laughs> You know, they're like, that would really, really, really upset my shidduch opportunities. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> talk about a shidduch crisis. Anyway, so I know this 45-year-old non-Jewish man in Kansas. <laughs> it's like a mess, you know? What are you going to do? But, uh, but when you really know something and that turns out not to be true, it's wrenching. So das is my sense of reality. Das tov is reality. Das Ra is illusion. And you could know illusion just as well as reality, and our hold on reality is tenuous at best. 1985, I was a NCSY chapter advisor in Los Angeles in 1978. 1985, one of my former uh, NCSYs was getting married. I decided to go out for the Shabbat Shabbat Brachas. I brought my son, who was one month old. And you know, at that age, really only a parent can understand and he told me, I mean, at least I understood, that he wanted to go to Disneyland. So, um, you know, you want to make a child happy. So I took him to Disneyland. And uh, they had just opened the haunted house. And okay, so the ghosts are running around and everything, you know. And as you're leaving, there's a sign. Don't pick up any hitchhiking ghosts, which, by the way, is always good advice, even if, <laughs> uh, even if you don't see a sign. Yeah? So as our little car is leaving, there's a mirror, and I see us. And in between us is a ghost. And so what do I do? Now, I'm a relatively intelligent person. Yeah? I look down. There's no ghost there. Of course there's no ghost there. And then I look back in the mirror, and he winks and waves at me. So I look a second time. <laughs> because that's how powerful an illusion is. An illusion is so real that you, that, that you buy into it so completely that you just don't even realize it. It becomes part of you. You, you don't know people who are more attached to films and literature than they are to, the, to real life? A guy said to me, confided in me, he said, 
I cried when Dumbledore died. If you haven't read the series, I'm sorry. I just <laughs> remember. He says, I cried when Dumbledore died. And then he looks at me and he says, I didn't cry when my grandfather died. <laughs> I said, that's because you weren't as attached to him as you were to Dumbledore. You were much more invested in his life and his existence. You know, you cared more about Dumbledore. You know, because you buy in. There was a very powerful book by Richard Bach called Illusions. It's a short book, and very powerful, about this guy who is a crop duster, you know, in the Midwest, and this, you know, godlike character comes and says that you're really a god, and you came down to this planet, and you forgot who you are, you know? And he's trying to remind him. And he takes him into a movie, his favorite movie, and it's reaching the end of the movie, and he says to him, why are you here? He says, let me just watch the end of the film. And he asks him again, why are you here? And he keeps asking him until the guy says, be quiet. At the end, he says to him, why was this so important to you? He said... You know that wasn't real. That was just light flickering on the world, flickering on the, on the, on the wall. And you know that those, the guy over there who got shot, he's not really shot. He's, he's living in Hollywood. He's doing very fine. You know? But you were so invested in that flickering light, that illusion, that it was more important to you than a real person who's sitting here talking to you. you know? That's what happens. We get caught up into the illusion. That's called Das Ra. Says Masil Sharm and Paragimel that because of this power, you could think that good is bad and bad is good. Bad is good, good is bad. Right? What would be bad? How about embarrassing somebody in public? Would that be bad? I would say that's, that would be bad. But you see this situation play out more often than we care to realize. Yeah? Somebody decides to tell somebody off. Right in front of everybody, and like really rank this guy out and give it to him over the head. And you see, everybody is embarrassed. And he says, or she says, what do you think, I'm doing this for me? I'm doing this for all of you. He's taking advantage of everybody. You know? I'm standing up to him. I'm doing the right thing. I'm embarrassing him in public, and I'm a big tzaddik. Because we can see something bad as being good. What would be good? I mean, there's something, something bad as good. What would be good? How about giving charity? You know, good thing. Charity, uh, you know, saves you from death, you know. Um, I'm not advertising uh, any particular charity, but if there was one, let's say, that was teaching Torah to, you know, people around uh, the metropolitan area and, and making activities and, you know, things like that, you know, it would certainly be worthy of our support, but I'm not talking about anything particular. Anyway, listen, what it, all, all, all I could say is that in the midst of tzedakah, we need chizik. Anyway, so... <laughs> Chizik with a Q. Anyway, so, <laughs> for bananagrams. But anyway, <laughs> so, um, so, okay, so uh, uh, giving tzedakah. What's the worst thing you could do? It says in Pekka Yavos, four levels. Right? Arba midas benosnei tzedakah. You don't give and you encourage other people not to give? That's a Russia. That's what it says. I was in a shul in Yerushalayim. And a guy came in to collect. I didn't know him. Nobody knew him. You know, it's not like in some neighborhoods where you get a letter, you know, a guy came in. I don't know, maybe he's sick. Maybe he can't work. I don't know. Maybe he's got a sick kid, needs an operation. Unfortunately, that happens all too often. You know, maybe he's just running back and forth and, uh, you know, uh, visiting his, 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 his sick wife in the hospital. I don't know what his story is. But this one member of the congregation is following him around as he's collecting, telling people, don't give him money. You're just enabling him. Let him go out and get a job. So here's a guy in shul wearing his talus and tefillin telling people not to give tzedakah and he thinks he's a tzaddik because that's the power of illusion. We can look at something bad and think it's good and good and think it's bad and it's just as equally real to us as anything else. That's called das ra. It's called illusion. When we reached Har Sinai, we reached the level of Adam Kodum Achet before the illusion went into them, before the das ra. All there was was Das Tov. And God opened up all the Rakias and said, take a look, is there anything here? There's nothing here. He opened up the home. take a look down. Is there anything here? There's nothing there. Look in all the directions. Look everywhere. In the sea. There's nothing, right? You are in complete contact with reality. Okay, Satan, now you're back to full power. Yes! Ah, it's great to be back. Let's have a little dead Moshe action over here. Let's have a little universe collapsing. Ah, I love my job, yeah? And he's creating all of these illusions. 
If your hold on reality is strong enough, you will not be fooled by these illusions. And if it's not, then you'll be suckered into the illusion. Yehoshua was in total contact with reality. It didn't matter what he saw. He knew what the truth was, and he knew this couldn't possibly be happening. But you have to be pretty strong in your convictions. Uh, Noah Weinberg Zatzal, the founder of Eishet Torah, used to give a marshal. You're sitting on the plane, you're going home. Shiva Bacha. Sits down next to a guy, and he says, oh, where do you live? Flatbush. Me too. Where? Uh, Avenue K. Hey, me too. Where? Between East 22nd and East 23rd. He goes, I can't believe it. That's my block. What's, what's your name? Moshe Cohen. Oh, very funny. My name's Moshe Cohen. <laughs> so the guy looks at you, pulls out his passport, your name, your address, his picture. He pulls out his driver's license, your name, your address, his picture. He pulls out his library card, your name, your address, his picture. He brings out a family photo, and he's standing there where you're supposed to be. Okay? I don't talk to him the rest of the flight. I don't even uh, borrow his pen to open up my special kosher meal. <laughs> I'm just ignoring him. We get off, we get our luggage, we take a taxi, we get home, and I see him walking into my house just ahead of me. So I go to the door, knock on the door. Hello, Tom, excuse me? Maisha, says, I have a son, Maisha. No, no, I'm Maisha. And the other guy pokes his head out and goes, Mom, this guy was with next to me on the plane, he's not well. She says, I'm sorry, young man, I can't help you, and shuts the door. What do you conclude at that point? I've asked this to people. I'm crazy. I didn't know it until this moment, but I'm obviously crazy. That's how strong our hold on reality is. I've lived 18 years, and because I've just been presented with a set of circumstances I can't understand, that means I've imagined my entire life. But you don't know who you are? You don't know what you've gone through? How could that possibly be? You know, there's got to be any number of uh, explanations. Maybe they're aliens, you know? Maybe uh, this is a CIA plot. Maybe someone's got a gun to my mother's head. I don't know. Find an investigative reporter, a couple of car chases, and we'll work this out. You know what I mean? But I know who I am. How strong is your hold on reality? What does it take you to give up on what you know to be true? How many people won't sell out? Somebody once said to me, said, Rabbi Alaska, you have integrity. I know you wouldn't sell out. I said, no one's offered me enough yet, that's all. <laughs> you know, what do you think, I can't be bought? And it's just, you know, I have too much pride to be bought for a small amount. <laughs> so who knows? Anybody, anybody knows how strong their conviction is? What's it, what's it going to take for us to, to the illusion to shake us out of what we know to be true? We all had a point time in our life when we had dreams, when we believed something, we knew what the truth was, and bit by bit, we become like everybody else. It's, it's a true statement. Most people do what most people do because that's what most people do. And to be true to your beliefs and be true to what you know is important, you know? Okay, I'll give you an example myself, yeah? I, I, I try not to talk in show. I try not to. And sometimes people come over to me people who are more respectable than I am, and, you know, rub on me, and they start to talk to me. I try to ignore them, you know, I just go, uh, uh, uh. And they start asking me, like, direct questions, and that, you know. Seldom do I have enough confidence to say to them, I'm, I'm sorry, but I, I don't talk in shul. You know, even though I don't, even though I believe it's right, you know. The, I, I'm not discussing the particular issue, but I know girls who have certain standards of, you know, of dress for themselves. Right, wrong, or indifferent doesn't make a difference. And they'll sometimes compromise that for whatever reasons they are. You know? Don't we, don't we all want to fit in? Don't we all want to be part of the crowd? How many people want to be the one who stands up and, and, and be different, even though it's what we believe in? Even though we're following what we know to be reality. And we'll sell it out will sell out reality for any number of things and will live an illusion. So people look at other people's marriages and they say, oh, they have a much better marriage than I do. I'll say to her husband, you know, oh, why can't you be like Yankee? Yankee helps so much and Yankee thinks and that. He goes, well, maybe if you were like Shani, I'd be like Yankee because Shani, then, then, then. Yeah, but that's because Yankee and Shani. 
you know, and everybody's kids are better than our kids, you know what I mean? And, you know, they're so well-behaved, you know, until, you know, they're so nice, they're so polite, and then one day they're in prison, you know what I mean? And, you know, it's like, because you don't know. You don't really know, you know, but we have a fantasy. We build up this whole fantasy in our mind. You know, if only I had that, you know? Uh, you know, the way many people date, you know, they do so much checking, you know, so much checking to make sure, and, the, and they go through it, and they discuss, and they, by the time they go out on the first date, they're already married with two kids, you know what I mean? <laughs> And it's one date, you know, and then, you know, one of them says, no, it's not going to work out, and they're going through a divorce, you know what I mean? Because they've already been married for two years, you know what I mean? Because in our mind, we build it up, we build it up, you know? And, and what's really important? What's really important to us? And often the most important things slip away, right? Have you ever heard anybody say in their 50s or 60s, I wish I could live my life over again? Why didn't you live it the right way the first time? Because I wasn't, I thought I wanted something else. I thought, I thought, I didn't realize. I didn't realize what reality was. I didn't realize what was really important to me. When I was teaching Yonah Sameach into the intro program, which is mostly collegiates, this older gentleman walks in. And I say, can I help you? And he says, I'm joining the intro program. I said, really? He says, Rabbi, I'm 82 years old. If not now, when? And I thought, wow, it's 82, and I'm going to start now. You know? Okay. That, that's good. Imagine if I started at 22. Imagine if I lived the life I wanted and I saw reality and I did what I know to be true. You know why we built the ego? Because we were fooled by the illusion. And that was the same sin in Tishvav. The people came back and said, we can't do it. It's too hard for us. We can't capture the land. The people are too strong, and the cities are too strong. And I don't have to go back to ancient time. Read the first-hand accounts of what happened in the, in, in the, in the Six-Day War. It was one Israeli soldier with a broken gun, and he captured 500 Egyptians. It was a true story. It was, it was documented. He jumped out. He says, everyone, drop your guns. And they did. I was like, cool. <laughs> All right, follow me. <laughs> you know? If we look at something, I saw a bumper sticker once. I saw one bumper sticker made a real impression on me. It says, if you can read this, then you're tailgating. But there was another one that said, it said, the impossible is the possible that hasn't happened yet. You know? Before uh, they broke the four-minute mile, Jim Thorpe was it? Roger Bannister. When he built, until he broke the four-minute mile, it was a given that you can't break the four-minute mile. Once he did, half a dozen people did. Because they everyone thought it was impossible. Once they saw it was possible, you know, we think it's impossible. You know, you can change the world. One person can change the world. You know? I, I know it sounds a little overdramatic, but who do you think is going to bring Mashiach? I mean, we're the cream of the Jewish people. We're the ones who are here on an evening to, become, to be able to hear a Torah lecture because we care. And that's the most important thing. They did a survey. They, they, the question was, would you agree that the two biggest problems affecting the Jewish people is ignorance and apathy? And the number one answer was, I don't know and I don't care. And is that, you know? So we're here tonight because we're the ones who care. Who do you think is going to bring Mashiach? It's going to be us. And it's just going to take a little bit. We're at the end of time. Bigger people than me have said this. It's going to take a little push. You know? All we have to do is take that same energy, that same concern, and shake away the illusions. It's the next step that defines who we are. It may not be the, the best source to choose, but as Bilbo Baggins said to Frodo, be careful when you step out of your front door because the same road that goes through the Shire leads to the lonely mountain. How very true. Yeah? It's the next step that we do that, that's going to determine the, the, the course of Jewish history. And you don't ever realize it. And I'm not talking about, you know, diving with such kavana, you know, that's a good thing. Don't get me wrong. I'm thinking about saying hello to somebody. Right? You ever read Chicken Soup for the Soul? There must be 18,000 people who didn't kill themselves because somebody said hello. You know what I mean? You, you smile. You help somebody out. You give a little something. You, do, you give a little bit. We care a little bit more. We have the power to shake off those illusions. And when we do, if we, during 
this time of year where we're recreating the events of the past 3,300 years. I don't think Rishon Zalman was just having fun with us when he said this year we're going to eat meat on Tisha B'Av. That's this year too. I'm not going to tell you there won't be a Tisha B'Av, just like I won't tell you there's no 4th of July in England. There'll be a Tisha B'Av. But it's a Tisha B'Av where, as the Gemara says, you can have a Suda Kishlomo Melech. We can ha- eat, a, a, eat a Shabbos meal with the finest, finest foods and then go from there to welcome Melech HaMashiach. We can do it. All we have to do is shake off those illusions. Thank you very much.